Welcome to worship here online at University United Methodist Church. Whether this is your first time worshiping with us or whether you tune in every week, I want you to hear this affirmation, whoever you are and wherever you happen to be on your faith journey or your life journey, you are welcome. Again, I'm so glad that you made the decision to be in worship with us this day. Let us indeed prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Again, welcome to University UMC. Today, we continue our lantern journey with Jesus through the wilderness, to the cross, and to Easter Sunday morning. Pastor Teresa will be continuing the sermon series, Hope is Here, inspired by a book by the same name, and it is written by Dr. Luther Smith. And he said, Hope is essential regardless of circumstances and living as a person of hope and love in serene times can be foundational to being a person of hope and love in desperate times now as we prepare our hearts for worship i pray this prayer of confession let us pray our heart are hard, O oh God. Soften them with your love. Our hands are clenched, O oh God. Open them with your grace. Our feet are planted too firmly, O oh God. Invite us to dance with you. Our lives are not our own, we know. Let us live and move and have our being in you. Amen. And now, hear the good news. God is gracious and merciful. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
As we continue our sermon series on hope, I remind you that last week I referred to hope as it apply, applies to ourselves, our own lives, and next week we will look at hope for the world. But today, hope for the church. And I begin by sharing with you today's gospel lesson from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers all seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told them that those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But of course, Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing and understanding of God's word. So this text from John's Gospel is a memorable story. Jesus is angry, and we often remember when people are really angry. I, through the years, have often heard self-identified progressive Christians pointing to this story and feeling satisfied. Satisfied as we consider a Jesus who overturns the tables of our favorite injustices. But let's not settle for another sermon where we celebrate the Jesus who criticizes someone other than ourselves. As our beloved Anne Lamont would say, we can safely assume that we've created God in our own image if God hates all the same people we do. More to the point, what might this passage say to those of us who are in the church today? Those of us who, yes, may be a bit self-righteous and idealistic at times, but who mean well and have good intentions. Those of us who are committed, but see worship attendance drip, dipping and declining over time. Those of us who love this community and wonder why others in the world don't see a place like this as relevant. Those of us who are leaders in the church and find costs of maintaining a beautiful old building rising while giving units are declining and staying flat. I didn't warn you that my sharing today won't be all warm fuzzies and feel good. It is true that sometimes we have to face the bad news before we get to the good news. And I promise the good news is coming. But first the bad news, or what I'd rather call the difficult news. You have been paying attention, so you know that the pews across many churches in our country are not as full as they were years ago. Our experience here at UUMC is far from unique. I was at a meeting recently, in fact, where it was mentioned that in the next few years, over 100,000 churches across the United States will likely close. Now, this isn't just in the United Methodist Church. All sorts of Christian churches are in decline and poised to close. We do not find ourselves in that statistic. I will be very clear about that. that we are not in that statistic. There is incredible, great energy here. Every morning at our sanctuary service, we see new visitors and guests most every Sunday. Incredibly generous people like many of you who worship with us online give financially and give a volunteer hours to keep our message of unconditional love and justice in action vibrant and thriving. So why do I bring up such a gloomy statistic, you might ask, about all those churches closing? Well, for starters, it is a wake-up call for healthy churches like UUMC to pay attention and to realize that we can't continue indefinitely with the status quo. We are not immune from some of the challenges facing all churches. 
It's also an invitation to the deep discerning work of how God is calling us to reimagine who we are in order to stay relevant and to be the church that God needs us to be in the future. I realize that as you are listening at this point in the sermon, you might be leaning in or scratching your head, wondering if I'm about to drop some big news, or maybe I have something up my sleeve, but I don't have any big news and I don't have anything up my sleeve, no specifics of any kind, other than to say the questions of how we stay relevant and how we might further serve the community are questions that are bubbling up among staff and leadership here at UUMC. Again, no specifics, and there is so much that I do not know, so much that I do not know that I'm still learning. But here's one thing that I do know, friends. Without a shadow of a doubt, I know that our hope for the future as a church is dependent upon our care for the city and our love for the community. It is what God calls us to do. The prophet Jeremiah says that God calls us to seek the welfare of the city, and Jesus teaches us to love our neighbors. And this is who you are. It's who you've continued to be and have been here at UUMC, caring about unhoused neighbors, collecting a special offering to feed hungry college students. Our hope for the future is dependent on our care for the city and our love for the community. It was years ago that a colleague first introduced me to a piece of artwork. And in this artwork, um, there is a sanctuary and it looks like it's a picture of the inside of a sanctuary, but right down the center aisle, you can tell that it's not a regular aisle. Instead, it's a city street. It's a fitting image for today's gospel letter, gospel reading, where we find that Jesus is entering our sanctuaries and driving us out into the streets in the name of love. The intersection of church and the wider community must always be before us. When it comes to the changing landscape of religion in this country, when it comes to the reality of church decline and the question of our relevance and our place in this community, I am not just here to tell you that good news can come after the bad news. I've come to tell you that I've experienced that over and over again. And this morning I woke, I awoke, awakened believing that it was the right time for me to share with you some of my experiences. As some of you know, I served as district superintendent prior to being appointed here at University UMC. In the United Methodist system, this means that I work with pastors and churches in the greater Austin area in an administrative role. I knew that this would be, I knew that this would mean working with the bishop on pastoral appointments and presiding at charge conferences. But what I was completely unprepared for was dealing with churches that were too fragile to keep open and the overwhelming work of closing them and repurposing the property. But here's what I learned in all that hard work. I learned that any work that is worthy and rewarding will stretch you and it won't always be easy and it won't always be fun. I often joke that I got most of my gray hairs dealing with church closures and the question of what to do next with the property, but it's probably no joke. Still, I will say that those projects have been among the most rewarding moments in my ministry. You may have heard, for example, of Life in the City United Methodist Church that thrives at the old Grace UMC campus just off of South Congress here in Austin. Or Austin New Church, a church that we welcomed from the Free Methodist Church that worships at the old Faith UMC campus on South Lamar using their sanctuary on the weekends as the music venue known as the O4 Center. Those projects that I was involved in were time consuming, causing me some sleepless nights, even causing me to receive some mail from people who weren't thrilled with our plans. But to see the new life on those campuses and the spirit of radical inclusiveness, this was inspiring enough to know that I would live through all that hard stuff again. 
The other thing I know and have experienced is that when it's a God-sized dream, it's way bigger than me as an individual, which means that I never have to engage in that work alone. I have the Holy Spirit with me and I have a strategy team. I had a team of committed laity and clergy, laity who were like lawyers and commercial real estate agents, bringing their expertise and more importantly, their heart and passion to see the Spirit birth the church into their next season of life and ministry. The last project that I worked on as a DS before being appointed here was at a church in central to southeast Austin. This church could barely afford to pay a quarter-time pastor. They could not pay their apportionments. There was severe deferred maintenance causing places in the buildings to be unsafe. When the strategy team was clear that the church needed to close, we took time to pray and engage in conversations about what might be next. We could try another new church start. We'd done that successfully, but we'd already done it a few times. We could sell the property and quote unquote, take the money and run. And while the money would have been nice, we knew that we would never get our footprint in that part of town back. So we decided to partner with Foundation Communities to build affordable housing on that property. I say we decided. I'm convinced this decision was spirit driven because it was way bigger than any of us around the strategy table, a God sized dream. That project is nearing completion. A large office suite will belong to the United Methodist Church for its purposes and ministries in the city. Stained glass from the old sanctuary will be taken and incorporated into that office suite. One of the people I follow is an African-American pastor in Washington, D.C. named Joe Daniels, and he says this. He says the question of church buildings and land is one of the defining issues facing American Christianity during the next few years. I couldn't agree with him more. I have lived it. This was the Sunday that I wanted to share with you some of these stories. Because when it comes to hope for the future of the church, you need to know that you have a pastor who has lived through some hard but rewarding things. We can do hard things because Jesus is with us. Jesus, the one who says the temple will be destroyed and rebuilt. But of course, he wasn't talking, the scriptures say, he wasn't talking about a physical temple building. He was talking about his own physical body. But that new life resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead, that power has consequences for us too. One of the young lay people on the strategy team that I worked with at the district level, she would often say, I don't understand why church people get so upset about things dying, whether it's a program or a ministry or even a church, because after all, we are in the dying and rising again business. The worst news is never the last news. In other words, we have hope for the future because the, we worship. We worship the very one whose business is resurrection. Again, no scratching your heads. I don't have anything up my sleeve, except to say, when you dream a dream for your church, keep this image of the busy street running through the church in your mind. For our hope for the future as a church is dependent upon our care for the city and our love for the people of this community. Friends, as I close us in a time of prayer, um, I imagine those of you worshiping with us online, and I want you to know that um, those of you that are recovering from surgeries and hospitalizations at home, we are keeping you in our prayer prayers. If you do have any prayer requests, joys, or concerns to share, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My contact information is on the church website. Also, I lift up prayers indeed for the world. There is so much heartache from Ukraine, um, from Gaza. We pray for all persons who are vulnerable, especially children and the innocent who are victims of war. We also pray for our leaders that they would be discerning about choices that lead to life abundant and peace for all people. 
I lift up also specifically this morning in these days following the fires in West Texas. We pray for all those who were in harm's way. We know of one older woman in her 80s named Joy who passed away and we lift up her and her family to God. Indeed, we give thanks for the firefighters and for all of the first responders who have continued to work so hard in recent days as people in the panhandle of Texas and other parts devastated by that large fire um, as they continue the recovery efforts. May our prayers be with them. Friends, as we look out at the world for hope, as we look at our own lives and even at our own church, sometimes we have hope and we want to get there quick and we have this image in our mind of how we want it to all turn out. But I want to share with you in closing as we turn to God, a writing that I found from a Presbyterian pastor in Dallas. Her name is Danielle Schroyer, and she has this beautiful writing about prayer and hope and the trust in God. And I want to leave it with you this day as I close my sermon and our prayer time. Danielle writes, I believe another world is possible. And I'm also wise enough to know I cannot possibly control its emergence beyond my own personal choices every day. Two things keep me going when so much in me feels like giving up. The first thing that keeps me going is my ardent belief in the goodness of the human spirit. God has given us everything we need to be the people that God is calling us to be. God, I want to repeat that part, God has given us everything we need to be the people that God asks us to be. No matter what road we may have gotten lost on, God is present to us within our souls and is always ready to gently bring us back. The second thing that keeps me going is my deep conviction in God's promise of salvation. In Hebrew, the word for salvation is yesha, and yesha can be translated wide open space. You can also describe yesha as an act of completion, of having all that is needed, and there is no fear in completeness. There's only abiding, being with. For me, salvation is that place between human effort and hope's most unreachable markers that are bridged by God and God alone. I believe more than anything in the world that God has designed us to be people who actively and intentionally walk toward hope and promise. And I also believe more than anything in the world that it will take God's divine and gracious action to bring that work to completion. Faithfulness happens with us and within us. Salvation happens for us and to us. So we work for the now. We walk with perseverance towards the not yet. And we trust God to bring about wholeness, whatever that happens to look like and however many ways it emerges. What I know deep within my soul is this. Even if things work out even if things don't work out as I imagine, I still believe that the Jesus way is my right work in this world. I'm committed, not because of outcomes, but because of love. And I trust in God's love, which is where hope and promise lead us inevitably. And also, I love God. That counts for something. I'm learning to be fine, not knowing the details or seeing the fruits. My hope is not in a situation but in someone, and that hope feels as solid as it's ever been. Amen.
invitation today is to join us here at University UMC as we renew our commitment to follow Jesus. We know you are connected in the life of our church through small groups and volunteering. But if you are new to our online worship service and want to learn more about us, please check out our website and contact any of us on staff. We are also very grateful for your financial generosity, which enables us to be a place of unconditional love and justice in action. You can visit our website and go to donate button to learn more about the way to give. Today, I would like to share with you about Amplify Austin Day. Amplify Austin Day is March 6th through 7, and before and during this time, people donate to more than 700 nonprofits in Austin and Central Texas area through the online platform AmplifyATX.org. And our Open Door Ministry also raises a major fund that will be used to provide the unhoused neighbors with necessary clothing, meals, and supplies every Saturday morning. And I can tell you that the need is growing. The average number of guests each week increased by 75% in 2023 compared to 2022. To help meet this need, our goal is to raise $10,000, which a generous friend of our ministry has offered to match. So please consider donating between now and Amplify Austin Day by checking out AmplifyATX.org. Thank you. Thank you, Earl, for sharing with us about Amplify Austin. And now, friends, as you go forth, I share with you this benediction written by Shane Claiborne. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace. Amen.